my gosh, is it ever a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Enad Wilf to you. Um, Enad has studied in this country at Harvard in France and also in the United Kingdom where she did a PhD in political science at Cambridge University. Uh, she has served in the Israeli parliament for three years during which she had important committee assignments in education, but also foreign policy and defense, where she finds the time to do everything she does, God only knows, but she's also the author and co-author of numerous important books. One of them in particular, I wanna to call to your attention, is called The War of Return, she co-authored this book with Adi Schwartz. Lots and lots has been written about the Arab-Israeli conflict, specifically the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I know of no book published in recent years more definitive in tracing the sources of irresolution in this conflict. She and her co-author, give us a very detailed history of the refugee problems, also of United Nations Committee blockages of what should be done, as well as Palestinian blockages as well. If I had to recommend one book and only one book for you to read about this conflict, nothing will rival this, The War of Return, which deals with the so-called right of return in as comprehensive, detailed, and definitive a fashion as anything I know. Uh, today, uh, Inad is going to speak to us uh, about a really interesting subject, namely Western anti-Zionism, but and unexpected to most of us until relatively recently, uh, Arab Zionism, it has its own history, but it seems to be a history that's maturing and producing some good results. And not Wilf, I hand over now to you. At the moment you're muted, but if you'll unmute yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Following your talk, I know for a fact that people will be interested in engaging you in discussion. We're honored to have you. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm honored to be here, and thank you truly for this very kind introduction. Um, so I want to share with you today a reflection that I've been having, uh, especially in the last uh, year uh, since the signing of the Abraham Accords, the normalization agreements, the peace agreements between uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, later to be joined by Morocco and Sudan, in, uh, with Israel. Uh, and I want to share with you my reflections about the growing uh, gap between how things look uh, from Israel and the region and how they look from in the West. So uh, when the Abraham Accords were uh, signed a little over a year ago, uh, there seemed to be almost a concerted effort in some circles to downplay them. Uh, so I understand the partisanship element. Uh, there was no desire to give uh, President Trump any credit, uh, but really there was a sense of kind of people saying, look, it's no big deal. Those are countries that don't have a border with Israel. They're not in direct war, uh, or this is, these are merely arms deals and they're a form of bribe. So there seemed to be almost a general sense of downplaying uh, these accords as nothing particularly important. Uh, and I want to make, of course, the counter argument that those accords are transformative and with transformative potential. Because one of the things that's been very clear with the accords, and we've been seeing it only become stronger and stronger since the accords were signed, is that the countries that signed them, especially the Emiratis and Bahrainis, have gone all in. And this has been, from uh, the Israeli perspective, a huge uh, surprise, because for many decades, Israelis were told that the most we can expect in terms of peace agreements is what we have with Egypt and Jordan. 
And uh, I sometimes jokingly describe the agreements with Egypt and Jordan as something that happens like in sixth grade when you decide to be boyfriend and girlfriend and then you decide to never talk to each other. Uh, so Egypt and Jordan both signed agreements, uh, Egypt in 79, Jordan in 94, uh, but those were very odd agreements in terms of calling them peace. They were defined as peace agreements, but there was not a lot in terms of the content. Uh, I think they're better understood as um, kind of non-belligerence agreements rather than proper peace agreements. I mean, there's barely diplomatic relations. I remember when as a member of Knesset, uh, I visited to attend a conference, I visited uh, Jordan and stated the ambassador's residence. There was a feeling that we were present in a very hostile country. Um, so barely any diplomatic relations, no economic relations, no cultural relations, no tourism. Uh, Jordan and especially Egypt have been at the forefront of anti-Israel resolutions in international bodies. Egypt for decades has been the number one producer and purveyor of anti-Semitic content in Arabic to the Arab world. And this is what we were told as Israelis is peace. And we were told that that's the most that we could hope for until the Palestinian issue is resolved. But this is what peace with the Arab world looks like. And then come along the Emiratis and Bahrainis and give us a completely different vision of what peace with the Arab world can and does look like. From the moment they signed the Abraham Accords, what we had was a deepening of cultural relations, of course, diplomatic relations, uh, tourism. Uh, I have to share with you the image of having the Emirates land in Israel is a remarkably powerful image for Israel. And not just that the Emirates land in Israel, we can actually board it uh, on the way for Dubai. I mean, the Emirates for years was this Shangri-La airline where, you know, they had a mythical first class and Israelis would just never be able to fly it. And suddenly, not only are we flying Emirates, they have a direct line, uh, Dubai to Tel Aviv, flying over Saudi airspace. Almost every day brings with it news of signing of more agreements in various fields of cooperation from high tech to water. Uh, the Israeli, currently we have the Dubai Expo, uh, very strong Israeli presence and representation. And you really see the people of Dubai and Bahrain going all in into these uh, agreements. The books, you know, how much do we speak about books, about teaching? Within days of signing the agreements, they changed the books to represent a much more positive image of Israel. And of course, the Jews. Uh, this is something that I'm sure you discuss frequently. The notion that one can be against Israel and against Zionism, but still not be against Jews. Uh, you as scholars, of course, know all the theoretical arguments why this might be possible to be against Israel and Zionism, but not against Jews, yet somehow it never works in practice. And what we see here is the exact opposite. As soon as the Emiratis and Bahrainis normalized relations with Israel and went all in, they also wanted to make it very clear that they are hospitable to Jewish life in their own countries. Now, uh, as I'm sure you understand, there's not a vast Jewish community in the UAE and Bahrain. I mean, I think they each have a barely a minion, but they are now in the business of showing how hospitable they are to Jewish life. Uh, we recently had the Jewish holidays. You could see Emiratis and Bahrainis uh, celebrating the Jewish holidays, taking those seven Jews they have in their community and making a whole operation of it to really show that they are uh, hospitable and welcoming of Jewish life. They wanna have kosher food at their hotels. On Emirates, there's now kosher food. 
So you see that this was an entire package of going all in. And not only is it all these elements, you even have a clear embrace of Zionism. Uh, and that's the thing that I also noticed. Uh, I became part of a WhatsApp people to people group uh, after normalization. And uh, the first time we had our Zoom conversation, uh, Israelis on the conversation were very apprehensive that we are not going to have any Emiratis or Bahrainis joining us. Because again, uh, Israelis will know that very well. You go to international conferences, uh, seek out anyone who's Egyptian, formerly Egyptians or Jordanians. They will not talk to you. They will not shake your hand. Uh, so we thought that if we're going on this Zoom talk, at best, we will have one Emirati uh, getting on the Zoom and maybe they won't even show their video. Uh, but they came, it was half and half. It was half Israelis, half Emiratis and Bahrainis. Many of them came uh, in traditional garb to show respect to the event. And one of the things that they were really fascinated by and they wanted to hear about was to understand Zionism. So in the next Zoom, I even ended up giving a talk about Zionism. And this was a talk about Zionism to an Arab audience who was genuinely interested. Uh, they were not looking to needle me. They were not looking to prove anything about Zionism being all of these evil words we associate that have become associated with it through uh, a very purposeful campaign. No, they were genuinely interested. And out of this uh, Zoom discussion of Zionism came an op-ed that I published with two young Emiratis, a man and a woman, uh, that opened basically with them proclaiming themselves as proud Arabs, proud Muslims, and Zionists. They didn't beat about around the bush. They said the clear word. They proclaimed themselves to be Arab and Muslim Zionists. And then they went on to write and explain why they see no contradiction, contradiction between the Arab identity and the Islamic identity in Zionism. One of the things that I found even more interesting is that they viewed that as the declaration of Arab and Islamic support for Zionism as the wave of the future. So for them, the normalization with Israel, the embrace of Israel, even accepting Zionism, was considered something that a future looking person will do, which is why those were two young Emiratis who wrote that. Uh, and when we spoke about it, what was interesting is that they described Arab anti-Zionism as belonging to the older generation. They said things like, Yes, my parents, my grandparents, they were like, it was Nasser. So for them, Arab anti-Zionism was something that belonged to the past. Their parents, even their grandparents, something to do with Nasser, a long dead figure. Uh, so not something that's exciting for young people, not an identity that a young Arab person will want to adopt. Now, you will correctly say, these are small countries, uh, they're minuscule, they're barely 1% of the population of the Arab world, not even. How is that relevant? And the reason that I think it's highly relevant for the Arab world at large is that the UAE might be a very small country, but it represents for many young Arab people, the future. I'm sure you remember that after 9-11, much of the discussion was about the failure of the Arab world, uh, the democratic deficit in the Arab world. Uh, UN committees published scores of reports about development gaps in the Arab world. The general theme was one of Arab failure. Um, and you have the UAE now representing a vision of Arab success. So 20 years after 9-11, after all this hand-wringing about Arab failure, you have an image, a visual image, you know, those skyscrapers. It's a visual image of Arab success. For 10 years running, the UAE is the number one place where young Arabs from the entire Arab world 
want to come and work. It's the place they want to be and to work in. So even though it's a very small country and represents a very small share of the Arab population, it punches way above its weight in terms of what it represents. It represents what its successful Arab future looks like. And increasingly a successful Arab future embraces Israel, normalizes relations with Israel, and even embraces Zionism, which is why you suddenly now have Egypt, after decades of not doing that, have it renewing a direct line, a direct flight line between Israel and Sharm el -Sheikh. So you're beginning to see the impact that it's having more broadly, not just about uh, the UAE and Bahrain and slowly with Morocco and Sudan. This is having a greater ripple effect. Um, so I think this is something that is fascinating that is taking place. It's beginning to also have an impact on how people view the conflict. Uh, we've recently seen these Iraqi convention of 300 Sunni and Shiite Iraqis that got together at Erbil mostly for their security, but they themselves being Sunni and Shiite. And I thought they made a fascinating point about the Arab world. They basically divided the Arab world into two, uh, almost kind of reflecting the Islamic thinking that there is a land of war and a land of peace. They said, in the Arab world today, there are the countries of war. They, and they mentioned Libya and Yemen and Syria and Lebanon. And then they said there are the countries of peace. And they mentioned the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco. And they basically said, we don't want to belong the, to the countries of war. We've had enough of that. We want to belong to the countries of peace. So we see that ripple effect. And again, of course, this is still very embryonic. Those people who came forward in Iraq are now being persecuted in Iraq. But you're seeing this ripple effect of saying there is a different Arab future that we want. And that Arab future includes embracing Israel. In the Iraqi declaration, they even spoke of atoning for uh, basically expelling their Jews brutally, Jews who pre-existed Islam and the Arab conquests uh, from the Babylonian exiles. Uh, and they too, in that Iraqi declaration, made the connection between embracing Israel and embracing Jews. They understood and they connected it. They themselves said, we are embracing Israel as one, not just as kind of a future looking vision, but also as atoning for our past sins when it comes uh, to expelling the Jews, understanding that the expulsion of Jews from Arab countries was a sin, something that they feel they need to atone for. And again, this shows us as soon as the Arab world turned anti-Zionist, it was inhospitable to Jews and Jews. And within a few short years, you no longer had Jews in the Arab world. And again, the UAE and Bahrain are now trying to reverse that. They're being pro-Zionists, Islamic and Arab Zionism, and therefore they're embracing Jewish life in their land. So I think the Arab world, we can be scholars, we can be theoreticians of why anti-Zionism does not have to be against Jews, but we're seeing in the Arab world the very practical uh, expression that says, when you're pro-Zionist, you're also hospitable to Jews. When you're anti-Zionist, you're inhospitable to Jews. Yes, in theory, it doesn't have to be that way. In practice, it never works. And this is what we're seeing across the Arab world. So a lot of fascinating things are taking place. This is beginning to have an impact on relations with Arabs within Israel, on the conflict. Uh, this has a ripple effect uh, because at the end of the day, the conflict has always been uh, about the Arab rejection of the Jewish right to self-determination in any part of the land. The Arab conflict has always been about Arab anti-Zionism. And these countries, the Abraham Accords, uh, and of course the name is very significant, signifying an understanding of the Jews not as foreigners, 
in the land. So not colonialists, not people who came from the outside, but indigenous people uh, who are in their land, who have a historical connection. So even the Abraham Accords embraces in that name the idea of Jews not as foreigners, because Jews as foreigners has been at the core of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Because if the Jews are foreigners, colonialists, invaders, then you fight to send them out. We just saw it recently in the Palestinian celebration of the America getting out of uh, Afghanistan and saying, this is the way, and this is how we're gonna throw out the Jews, throw out Israel, because they're foreigners. So at the core of the conflict is the simple question, are the Jews foreigners or not foreigners in this land, foreign or indigenous? And uh, the Palestinian and still the dominant narrative in the Arab world is that the Jews are foreign, but we're beginning to see a different story and it is now a confident story. You're seeing Arabs embrace it confidently. Many of my Emirati's colleagues are active on Twitter and when they are blamed, a Zionist, you know, they support Israel, they support normalization. So people write to them on Twitter, you're a Zionist, uh, thinking that it's a slur. And their response is confident. Yes, what of it? I mean, what's wrong with supporting the Arab, the Jewish right to self-determination in the land? We're still pro-peace. We want the Palestinians also to have their state, but next to Israel, not instead of Israel. So we're, they're no longer in the business of trying to repel the foreigners. Now, Israelis are seeing that. Israelis are feeling that. There's a real sense of the beginning of the lifting of the siege, something that was not that powerful over the years with uh, Egypt and Jordan. Uh, here, because we could fly to Dubai, there's a real sense of the lifting of the siege, the Arab siege around Israel, the idea that Israel is a foreign element in the region. So Israelis are seeing that, Israelis are embracing that. Uh, we saw it, for example, how quickly Israelis dropped the idea of annexation uh, in order to have normalization with Dubai because the priority of Zionism has always been to have a state in the land rather than all of it. And if we can have peace, uh, then that's clearly a greater priority. So Israelis are seeing that. And then they see in the West, the rise of this virulent anti-Zionism that is now kind of moving from the academia, from campuses into Congress, into media, into the general population, and it makes no sense. Because supposedly, if anti-Zionism, if virulent anti-Zionism was merely the passionate expression of caring about the region, about Palestinians, about human rights, about Israel not being at peace with its neighbors, then you would expect an embrace of the Abraham Accords. But the anti-Zionists, of course, were at the forefront of minimizing and downplaying these accords, which begins to raise the suspicion to those of us who do not have it already, that there's something else at play. Because when you're seeing something so disconnected from the local regional reality, you have to begin to ask questions. One of the reasons that anti-Zionism in the West has been able to escape for a relatively long time, the charge of being anti-Semitic is that it masked itself very well as concern for real issues, concern for peace in the Middle East, concern for the Palestinians, concern for human rights. So people were very much taken in by this mask and thinking, okay, anti-Zionism is a cause of social justice. It is a cause that seeks to better the world. But then when you see it being so disconnected from regional developments, Israel is moving towards peace and normalization and being embraced uh, in, the, in the Arab world. And the conflict with the Palestinians is beginning to shrink into a smaller size. And what you're hearing from the Arab side of what, what you, they say about the conflict 
I mean, there was an amazing moment that flew under the radar and I think should have been headline news. The Palestinians feeling betrayed by the Abraham Accords because for decades, the ability of the Palestinians to reject Israel and Zionism came from the fact that they had Arab backing. They, they had a blank check to say no to Israel and to fight Israel. They go to the Arab League. The Arab League, which in many ways was organized around anti-Zionism, organized against the notion that Israel is a foreign element that has to be repelled. The Arab League that threw out Egypt, the mother nation, when it made peace with Israel, the Palestinians go to the Arab League, expecting the Arab League to have their back, as it always had. And they say, look, look at what the UAE and Bahrain are doing. Uh, it's crazy. They're normalizing. They're going all in. Do something. And the Arab League, what does the Arab League do? Shrug its shoulders, basically saying, nah, these are sovereign nations and we're going to do nothing about it. One Arab described it as the Brexit moment of the Arab League. You know, those are sovereign nations. We don't care. Um, that's huge. That should have been headline news. Completely flew under the radar. The Arab League no longer being that forum where Palestinians can get a blank check to reject Israel and to oppose peace and normalization. But none of that is being reflected in the Western discourse. On the contrary, you're seeing anti-Zionism become more virulent, more virulent. And this is where a lot of people raise questions because it's clearly disconnected. I mean, the mask is being taken off, the mask of really caring about peace in the Middle East, caring about Israel being a problematic element in the Middle East. This mask is being torn away by the Abraham Accords, by the normalization, and then all that is left is really the hard core of anti-Semitism, which I think is harder and harder to mask. And then the question is, why? If we really understand Western anti-Zionism, we understand that it's disconnected from the region, that it's disconnected from Israel, that it's actually not about Israel, then what is it about? And I'm increasingly of the view that it's about America. Because there's a classic question about anti Semitism. Is it ever about the Jews? And my answer is of course not. Anti Semitism ultimately is a manifestation of a crisis that is taking place in the society that is doing the hating, that is doing the anti Semitism, that is experiencing the rise. And that crisis is being played out on the backs of the Jews, but the crisis is not about the Jews. So I increasingly believe that the rise in virulent anti Semitism, now only thinly masked uh, anti Semitism, this rise of uh, anti Zionism, is reflective of issues in America. And that America is going through whatever America is going. I'm sure this is your discussion. And this is merely an expression of that. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Yigal Ram, used a beautiful phrase, called it a Disneyland of hate. How societies uh, project their own issues, their own unsolved problems on the Israeli-Palestinian issue as a form of uh, Disneyland. Basically, they can do it in a safe way rather than engaging in a bloody local civil war. Uh, they can project uh, their issues on this faraway conflict and, and their ability to express hatred thereby becomes safer. It becomes Disneyland because you can do so against the Jews, against Israel, against Zionism. So. I think this is something certainly many of you already knew and already realized. But for me, the fact that the region is changing, that you see this rise of Arab Zionism, even Islamic Zionism, the change in the region, it really begs the question of what is causing the rise in this virulent anti-Zionism in America. And I think this really points to the answer that it's not about Israel, it's not about the region, it's about America.
Thank you.